here in this box, which I call my memory box, are items of remembrance of Reverend Master Jiu. I got it together because I thought, well, maybe if I lose my memory, I'll be able to remember her through items in the box, which is what is quite common in care homes, isn't it, when dealing with Alzheimer patients. I don't plan to be that way, but it just seemed like a rather convenient way to put it all together in one place. As I said in the talk, one talk, everything that's happened to my life and your lives up to this point has got you to this point. And it's a, however much one has an attitude or an idea about your life, you can at least be grateful for having got here. And as I said in the dedication, um, thank you, Rev. Master Ji, for turning up. And if you can do it, we can do it too. It's pretty basic, isn't it? And before that, there were some rather important qualities that we bring with us. And I'll leave the dedication so you can, so you can read it. I think uh, since thinking about it, <coughs> I'll call this my gratitude box. I mean, gratitude for all that has led up to my life and all of my life before becoming a monk. And of course, Reverend Master Jiu had a life before coming becoming a monk. Certain areas that we have in common. She was a girl guide. She was in the Heather Patrol, and I was in the Kingfisher Patrol, at a different time and a different place. And I would say, while well, some people don't do so well with the guides, I did quite well because it injected um, some discipline into my life, as I probably needed it, being a bit of a wild, adventurous young girl. So that's that. Reverend Master Jiu was, uh, father was a, a tailor and she really believed in looking good. Um, in fact her father would have make her um, a dress and coat and have her as his advertisement in Hastings and St. Leonard's. And she believed in repurposing, she'd probably call it not that, um, but I picked up this piece of fabric, which is a scrap from um, what we call a funeral bowing seat, which is usually edged in um, gold brocade. And this was probably, well, I think it was a dress that she had. So she, she was pretty fabulous in her dressing and um, used to dress up for singing in concerts and the like. So she instilled in me a, a sense of, I think, style, because I certainly had, didn't have it before I became a monk. To look, you know, dungarees were it in my uh, later life. Um, so she instilled in us that we should not look like we came out of a charity shop, but we were to dress smartly. Not too stylishly, but smartly. She was... Uh, she volunteered to be in the Navy and as a, uh, and it was HMS Sussex and there she is with her shipmates. And you'll have a chance to look closer. She's fond of those times. And, and again, I, I actually do realize that uh, she wrote a piece, an oratorio, called The Great Enlightenment, when she was, I suspect it was a, a piece of work for her degree, when she did an external degree, music degree from Durham. And this is a copy of the score of The Great Enlightenment, so it is actually her writing and her notations, which I think is so good. In this box is a copy of the actual uh, recording of the Great Enlightenment. And um, as a younger monk, we, uh, we would get together and try and sing it. But if you heard the high notes, it was try and sing it. Sometimes probably a bit painful for people. 
What next? Well, I brought my hot, my the fountain scepter here. And you've seen that portrait of her that was done by Reverend Master Mark again. And uh, it's an oil painting. And it was, here's a copy of it. She did it before Reverend Master G died, knowing that it's customary to have a photograph, uh, a, a, a portrait of a um, deceased master. And this is the photograph it was taken from. And it's her sitting in her seat in the meditation hall at Shasta. And if you look very clearly above her head is a, sh <laughs> is a cobweb. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously that didn't get included into the, the painting. Now, the first teaching that I heard from Reverend Master Jiu, I heard it when she was on television, just after she had been ordained and had come to Japan. And she was being interviewed by a journalist, a, a, a journalist from Southern Television, because I lived in Sussex. And she lived in Sussex. And he said, she was standing, I can remember everything about it. I can rem remember everything about me. I was probably um, sitting in the dark smoking. My mother was very tolerant. Um, and she came on and got my attention. And the interviewer said, Miss Kennett, what does it take to live the religious life? And she gave um, a very succinct answer. And it's uh, known as uh, actually the three pillars of Zen. And if you've ever read um, Kaplow's book, Three Pillars of Zen, he actually talks about this. Uh, and well, she said, great, great hope, great doubt, and great faith. Well, that's one way of putting it, and it was very accessible to me at the time because I just heard her say it so strongly. The actual teaching, it's a Japanese teaching, and it's on page 48 of this book here. And it talks about, um, let me see, um, great resolve, which we've been talking about this week, clear, clear resolve greater than the, the, the small efforts we all think we are doing. And that great resolve, uh, it goes hand in hand with great faith. So it's about training, uh, and the resolve and faith together dissolve <coughs> great doubt or great questioning. The great questioning, and it's not the sort of downward-looking doubt, it's more an upward-looking doubt of What's the, you know, how what's what's it all about, you know? Um, if this, and then we start to ask questions about big questions like, what's my purpose? Where, why am I here? Why are we here? Why is the suffering? Which is of course what the Buddha um, um, was wised up about. You know, he saw the signs of birth, old age, disease and death, and then a holy person, and he went forth eventually to train. And I suppose seeing Reverend Jiu when I was a mere, I think, 14, this was, let me just see, I have to work it out every time. Uh, I think this was 1962, and I would have been about 14. So it left a big impression on me. And as I went after seeing this, as I hopped up the stairs to go to the loo, I thought it came to me. Well, if she can do it, I can do it too. And then <coughs> I lived my 20s, as maybe some of you lived, not too wildly, but wildly enough. And um, through a bunch of, she used to say, well, she used to say, God writes straight with crooked <coughs> lines. We can say the eternal writes straight with crooked lines. And our lives, I think you will recognize, are... <coughs> Somewhat, you know, twist this way, twist that way. 
which br brings us to right here. And, uh, and that's what I remember thinking. If she can do it, I can do it too. But I you know, basically forgot about it. And then the twisting and turnings led me to somebody who knew somebody who came here. And I came here in 78, I think. 78, 79 possibly, the first time. Hmm. It was only two years after I was ordained, one night, uh, during a ceremony, that I went, oh my goodness, that's the same person I saw on television. I must have known on some level, but then I, I fully realized that this person was uh, the person I'd seen on television. And Maybe two decades later, earlier. Kind of interesting, isn't it? I must have had in some sewn in some part of my back of my mind because I had a near miss with seeing her when she was here in 1972. It wasn't going to work, and in 1969, I I was going to go to Japan to find her. So I must have known. But uh, gladly I didn't get to Japan because she just left. Mm -hmm. See how the crooked lines help us. And you can trust. You can trust and trust yourself and make your decisions and listen to those little promptings that say, oh, why don't go, you go up to Throstle or why don't you just go and have a sit? I'll fast forward 30 years when I was um, doing training at Shasta and then coming here and running temples and the like and um, I was fortunate enough to end up at various times but last three years of her life as a chaplain, her sister, one of her no, several assistants. And actually, it was the year before she died. She gave this number of us who are chaplains a choice of choosing something that um, an item of personal ch personal use. And this is her personal incense box. It's a black lacquer. It's got the same incense in that was there before. It's been and. Um, I do keep an elastic band around it because it tends to tip over. And it has the, the crests of Sodigi, the Polonia flower, and Aegi, Aheji, which is the sister or brother uh, monastery of, a, of the Soto Zen um, school. Aheji, Aheji, and Sodigi. That's their crest. I don't know what that word is, but it looks like a flower. And so, uh, one of the uh, teachings that comes is out of a book, which I can't remember which, that there are items of, of remembrance and items that have been personally used by what somebody have particular place in the scheme of uh, remembrance and honouring. And so I chose this because I knew that she had used it during a particular ceremony. And so that's it's very easy to get sentimental, but this isn't about sentimental. This is about many things, many things. And I was her, her uh, person that, um, I don't have anything else in here. Mm. No, nope, you can dig around in the box afterwards because I'm not going to show you everything. So, you sp did you see the picture on the altar of her on uh, wheelchair? Yes, I'm very proud to say I took that picture. Several of them back in 82. She didn't actually like them very much, unfortunately. Um, and so, uh, for a ceremony in, in later life, she would put on her robes, much like I have my robes, and she would um, get in her electrically powered scooter 
and uh, um, take off. And at a certain point, let me have a little drink. Um, at a certain point, she would come out from the shelter of the cloister, and at that point, she would be coming out into bright sunshine. Her eyes were quite sensitive. So uh, I, I knew from experiences that's when she wanted her sunglasses. And we were just coming out, mercifully I'd remember them, because there's a lot going on with getting her out of, dressed out of the house onto a scooter and away. Um, mercifully, I had remembered her glasses, and I generally did. But she just put her hand, and it was this hand, she put it out, and I put the glasses into her hand so she could put them on. She turned slightly and said, not bad, the girl. <laughs> <laughs> not bad. I, she's listening. And that is the crux of the matter, of this internal listening and paying attention to detail. And I never wear them. I mean, as much as I kind of quite wear sort of 50s glasses, aren't they? But they last fake bamboo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they probably come back into Oh, they yeah, probably been it. In yeah, oh, <laughs> bound to have done. Yeah, yeah. So another object of reverence and remembrance, rather, is um, a relic, physical relic of the uh, the deceased person, and it's regarded as very special to have an actual relic. You know how we venerate. Um, relics of the Buddha and other great masters and they go on a tour and you can go and take a look at them and bow to them and offer incense etc. Well Reverend Master Ji was not cremated, she was a full body burial but her, her chaplain several years before had anticipated this time when we would need to have relics only we wouldn't be able to have any in the summer, Reverend Master would spend her summer period in the Bay Area um, because of the heat at Shasta Abbey. And she would grow a short amount of hair so that she um, would go um, shopping, she liked to shop, and um, she would be in civvies, as she calls it. and so. She didn't look odd with her no hair, so she would grow a crop of hair. And at the end of the summer, she would have it shaved off. The blessed chaplain thought ahead, and we all got a lock of her hair. Yeah, this looks like it was going grey. It was. So that's a very special item which I keep in a wooden stupa on my altar. Mm -hmm. We know about stupas, I'm sure. Well, I hope you do anyway. Often there's um, relics in a stupa, a massive stupa in India, and and uh, it's on, the stupas are honoured by circumambulating them, walking around carrying incense and a flower and a candle, the uh, traditional offerings. Hmm, do I have anything else to show you? What was that? I, can you just take a look in there? Is there some... No, I didn't put them in there. We forgot. we we'll forget about that. I actually had an item of her clothing, which is um, uh, some little white socks. I have a place for the, th the uh, big toe and the, those toes, but unfortunately they, I was going to wear them today for the ceremony, but they don't fit me. <laughs> but I wanted to show them to you. So... There's lots of other things in there, but um, oh, I just show you one more thing before I know that time is running out. 
At a certain point, Rev Master all gave us all these beautiful wooden containers which have a little pulley out thing here. And it contains powdered incense. And perhaps before soap was so readily available, after washing your hands, um, or bef uh, is equivalent to washing your hands or purifying your hands, you would shake it. Oh, my goodness, there's quite a bit of it in there. Um, you'd rub this powdered incense into your hands. And this little thingy here would be hanging on the wax or so it would always be there. <coughs> so if you were wondering what that was, that's what it is. I hadn't realised there was quite so much. say I'll, I'll um, leave this all out and you can ro rootle about. It's nice isn't it to dig around something and see what you can find. With respect obviously. But don't don't handle it like ever so holy. Because one thing she said to us when she'd give us things and you know she was constantly passing on things that she no longer needed said, for goodness sake, don't put me on a shelf and dust me off. <laughs> I use what I give you, <laughs> would you please? So she didn't go for this venerating, oh, it belonged to Red Master Jew, I must, I must venerate it. But, you know, as you would handle anybody's things with respect. I'm just going to read you that um, offer tree, that dedication, and then I'll hope you've stored up some thoughts and questions. This ceremony is dedicated to Ho Eun Ji Yu, master, teacher, guide, and compassionate friend, first founder of Throstle Hole Buddhist Abbey. And the next section is cribbed from a scripture which is the immeasurable life of the Tathagata, yes. When sentient beings in faith and humility, when I'm stressing these, I'm hoping I'm harking back and reminding those of you who've been on retreat the kind of things I've been talking about. When sentient beings, that's us, in faith and humility, honest and forthright in manner, firm, kind, gentle, gentle in thought, wholeheartedly yearn to know the Buddha, not begrudging even our own lives, then, with all the Sangha, you, as in Jiyu, appear eternally on Vulture Peak, voicing the Dharma. And then I said, thank you for turning up to, for us, and if you can do it, we can do it too, which harks back to the first time I saw her, of course. <laughs>